In the 23rd century, men and women are free to do whatever they like, except turn 30. Then they must sacrifice themselves or become runners, doomed individuals who face deadly justice at the hands of the dreaded Sandmen. One of these Sandmen, Logan Five, uncovers rumors of a secret place called Sanctuary, where runners might be free, and he is sent on a covert mission to find and destroy it, all while being hunted by his former partner, Francis Seven. As Logan and a young woman named Jessica Six begin to untangle the lies they've been fed since birth, their search for sanctuary becomes something more. Before we get started, if you could please hit that like button, it'll increase my odds of making it to YouTube adulthood without being chased down by that brutal algorithm. If you really do like what I'm doing, don't forget to subscribe to see more content. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. In the late 60s, MGM and producer George Pal secured the rights to the recently published science fiction novel Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Hoping to ride the success of 1968's Planet of the Apes and 2001 A Space Odyssey, Pal wanted to infuse the adaptation with social relevance and put Robert Redford in the title role, but script delays pushed the project into the early 70s. With science fiction becoming far less popular and profitable in those days, Pal, citing health concerns, left the project to work on Doc Savage, The Man of Bronze, which would prove to be his last picture. Even though most of Hollywood had lost faith in science fiction cinema, one producer who hadn't was Saul David, known for producing the science fiction films Fantastic Voyage and Skullduggery. While Skullduggery had proven to be a failure, David was convinced that there was still a place for science fiction, and so he picked up the pieces of Pal's aborted adaptation and ran with them. With MGM unenthusiastic, David first took Logan's run to Irwin Allen, who was interested enough to purchase the rights to the novel, but became so busy making his legendary disaster movies The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno that he let them lapse. Then, when Soylent Green and Westworld proved to be modest, though not enormous, financial successes for MGM in 1973, the studio was once again interested in the project, so David was given a green light to produce Logan's run himself. With a new script by Straw Dogs screenwriter David Zella Goodman, David hired Michael Anderson to direct the project, a London-born director who spent many years working as an assistant under the legendary Peter Ustinov. Anderson was known for The Dam Busters, Around the World in 80 Days, and ironically enough, George Pal's Doc Savage: The Man of Bronze. Much later in his career, he would move to Canada and direct the schlocky time travel cult classic Millennium, a guilty pleasure of mine. Forget about this. There's going to be a paradox if you don't. For the lead role of Logan 5, Anderson brought in Michael York, who he'd just filmed in Conduct Unbecoming. A relatively young British actor, though it bears noting he was over 30 at the time, York made a name for himself on stage with the National Theatre, where he trained under Laurence Olivier. He'd also done some notable film work in Franco Zeffirelli's adaptation of Romeo and Juliet and the 1972 version of Cabaret. For the female lead, Jessica Six, they hired another British stage actor, Jenny Agater, who had some minor television and film work under her belt, though nothing as significant as Logan's run. The role nearly went to Lindsay Wagner, but during screen tests, Anderson felt that Agater had better chemistry with York, which they chalked up to having worked together before at the National Theatre. The role of Logan's friend-turned-antagonist Francis Seven was first offered to William Devane, who pulled out at the last minute feeling the role just wasn't a good fit for him. With only a few days left before filming began, Anderson hired the Harvard-trained character actor Richard Jordan. Around here, I'm Mr. Prescott. For the role of the nameless old man that Logan and Jessica encounter towards the climax of the film, Anderson initially tried to hire James Cagney, but the actor was resolute in his retirement at the time. Instead, Anderson managed to get his longtime friend and collaborator Peter Ustinov to deliver perhaps the film's most memorable performance, improvising a lot of his dialogue on set. Minor roles were filled by the great Roscoe Lee Brown as the android box. Overwhelming, am I not? The director's son, Michael Anderson Jr. as the new face doctor. And of course, Farrah Fawcett as Holly 13. Also noteworthy is Laura Lindsay, who plays a nameless runner in the voice of the computer, along with Playboy playmate Ashley Cox, who plays this random girl at the end. 
For the special effects, Anderson turned to Glenn Robinson, an MGM regular who'd done work on The Wizard of Oz, Forbidden Planet, and Earthquake, and L.B. Abbott, the former head of the special effects department at 20th Century Fox, famous for his work on Fantastic Voyage, Planet of the Apes, and The Poseidon Adventure. The visual effects were done by Matthew Yurizich, known for Forbidden Planet, Ben-Hur, and Soylent Green. There are plenty of notable effects in Logan's Run, like the extensive miniatures, the gas-powered laser pistols, and the android box. By far the most complicated, though, was the carousel sequence, which required dozens of stunt actors on wires with pyrotechnics strapped to their backs, along with some optical overlays and extremely precise editing. During an early attempt to pull it off, the wires became hopelessly tangled and the stunt actors had to be rescued one at a time by forklifts over the course of a couple of hours. For the era, the effects are mostly successful, but the miniatures never look like anything but miniatures, and there are a few effects that come across as notably bad. It doesn't help in retrospect that, merely a year later, Star Wars would blow it completely out of the water. Still, the film did share a controversial Academy Award in 1977 with King Kong for its effects. The Academy had decided to do away with the category of special effects that year, so the award given to Logan's run in King Kong was dubbed the Special Achievement Award. Though most of the film was done on sets and MGM backlots, some major set pieces were filmed in several unique locations in Texas, including the newly erected Dallas Market Center, the Water Gardens in Fort Worth, and more, which shaved a couple million dollars off the film's budget. The score was done by science fiction staple Jerry Goldsmith, and though I don't think it's his best work, he does do something interesting with it. For the scenes that take place within the city, he sticks with a largely electronic score, whereas for scenes in the outside world, He opts for a strictly orchestral one. The film released in June of 1976 and was a decent success. Though it wasn't beloved critically, many critics dismissed it as derivative dystopic drivel, it earned $25 million domestically against a $7 million budget. What most critics missed about Logan's Run is its timely cultural resonance, and they failed to account for the growing hunger audiences had for science fiction. The former seems obvious in hindsight. For a whole generation of kids who came of age during the Summer of Love less than a decade earlier, this movie reflects their attitudes going into adulthood, leaving behind their utopic dreams of free love and consequence-free decadence, and coming to appreciate the previously dismissed wisdom of their elders. In that sense, it is a surprisingly conservative film, a rallying cry for traditional values and monogamy, even as it portrays a sexually liberated society. As for science fiction cinema, Logan's Run represents the end of an era, the first big-budget sci-fi spectacle of the 70s to be a major box office hit. It paved the way for Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, acting as a harbinger of the science fiction boom that was to follow. Looking back on it now, it's hard to look beyond its schlocky 70s aesthetic, its wonky pacing, and its uneven special effects, but make no mistake— Logan's Run is one of the most important and influential science fiction films ever made. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you want to support this channel even more, head on over to my Patreon, where you can get your name in the credits, watch bonus videos, vote on future topics, and more. You can also find written reviews of many sci-fi classics, including the novel and movie versions of Logan's Run, at my website at emcgill.com. Until next time, when we'll try to figure out who controls the universe, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
Cats? Yeah, and they've each got their own name. Cats, of course. What else would they be called? <laughs> Cats! 